Hi, everybody. I'm Wendy Murdoch, and this is Webinars with Wendy. I'm doing a series of webinars to help people understand more about their horse and hopefully help them have a safe and happy horse um, and avoid some of the problems that we talk about on this show. Um, tonight, my guest is Maureen Kelleher. She's the vet at um, Marion DuPont Center in Leesburg, Virginia, and she's um, been so kind to come back for another webinar. So thank you so much, Dr. Helen Kelleher, and, and uh, for joining me again tonight. No problem. My pleasure. My pleasure. Um, yeah. So if you could just give people a little bit of your background and a little bit about Marion DuPont for those who haven't watched our previous webinar, that'd be great. Uh, sure. So I'll start with um, Marion DuPont Scott Equine Medical Center. Um, we're in Leesburg, Virginia, so Northern Virginia. And we are a referral center, so we've got um, seven specialists here and we see more advanced cases and we do um, lots of um, not only uh, elective cases, but also emergency cases. So um, my role here is um, equine sports medicine and surgery. And so um, I see a lot of cases for lameness, poor performance. Um, and I do a lot of imaging. So uh, we have an MRI here, we have um, a CAT scan or CT scanner, we have nuclear scintigraphy or bone scan. Um, and so using some of these more advanced imaging items, um, I help with diagnostics um, of some more um, uh, hard to find lamenesses and poor reasons for poor, for poor performance. Um, I am a board certified surgeon and hopefully soon board certified sports medicine and rehab specialist. Um, I went to vet school at UC Davis in Davis, California. I did an internship um, at a performance horse, predominantly Western performance horse practice in Northern California called Pioneer Equine. And then I practiced for several years in a um, sports medicine practice, doing a lot of show horse medicine. Um, so I did a lot of uh, lameness and imaging there, uh, traveling around from show to show with the horses in Southern California. Then I uh, did a surgery residency at UC Davis. And then uh, before I came to Virginia, I spent about another 10 years doing uh, performance horse or uh, English performance horse medicine in Southern California. So lots of um, performance horse medicine and then um, a, fair, a fair bit of uh, rehab and, and throw some surgery in there as well. Yeah. And then you came to Virginia. <laughs> then I came to Virginia, which is quite different than my many years in California, but it's um, very, uh, while it's different, it's also the same. Uh, the horses are all very competitive. They're all very um, high caliber and um, just a little bit difference in my population. Uh, I did predominantly jumping horses, uh, show jumpers, uh, show hunters and uh, dressage horses and race horses in California and definitely see a, um, all of that, but a, a much higher population of event horses here, mm -hmm. um, which is uh, probably unique to Virginia um, or this area anyway. So, um, but that's fine. I find the event horses and the um, event folks to be super, super to work with. That's great. Yeah. And um, Land Rover is going to be this weekend. Yes, it is. Yeah. So yep. that's pretty amazing. Um, yeah. I actually have a virtual booth there for Surefoot. Um, they, oh, they're they're, nice. Yeah. They're not yeah. open to the, they're going to open to the public in May. So I'm hoping uh, by the time they get around to the retired racehorse project. Oh, yeah. 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 Nice. Yeah. Cool. Um, cool. All right. So tonight, um, tell us a little bit, just, let's just, Jump right into your topic. Yeah, so this is a little bit of a tougher um, topic than our previous one about the deep digital flexor tendon. Um, it's a little bit uh, more specific, I guess. Um, I was going to chat a little bit about um, the suspensory ligament. And I know for many of you, probably when somebody tells you their horse has a suspensory ligament, um, it's almost like they said a four letter word. And um, I think uh, to some degree, 
depending on the degree of injury, um, that is true. Um, but um, there's such a variation in degrees of injury and also some, in my mind, often um, uh, the suspensory lig ligament gets jumped to automatically without a good investigation. Um, and so I just want to sort of maybe highlight some of those um, flaws in uh, veterinary medicine. Um, and maybe if your horse is diagnosed with that, um, with a suspensory ligament, you just need to make sure that all your I's are or all your I's are dotted and T's are crossed before you really um, sink into that diagnosis. Um, so I'm going to share. Yep, I think I made you co-host. Yep. Okay. Share. Okay. I'm going to present. Okay. So um, I'll probably go back and forth. I've got a couple of slides here. And so I'm sorry if I jump around back and forth a little bit, but um, the first uh, thing on um, on here that I want to just point out, hopefully you can see my cursor, yep. um, is where the suspensory ligament is. Um, and so if, the, if we're looking at the front leg, um, it's going to be uh, just below the knee. So here's our carpus. Um, here, this is a, a back view of the carpus. And so the suspensory ligament is going to snuggle right in between the splint bones and attach along the back of the cannon bone. So it comes down the back and then it branches off. So it makes two branches, a lateral and a medial suspensory branch that attach to the top of the sesamoid bones. So the suspensory ligament itself is part of sort of this um, uh, method to sort of keep the fetlock um, in its place. So um, along with the sesamoids and some of these um, sesmoidian ligaments down the back of the pastern, we sort of prevent the fetlock from hitting the ground. Um, and so one of the main functions of the suspensory apparatus is to um, store energy for um, propelling the horse forward. So it's, it's a very elastic, strong but elastic structure, and um, it helps to store energy along with the flexor tendons, um, store the energy from, you know, the horse uh, sort of uh, coming off the ground and propelling itself forward. So um, that, that's its function. And so uh, again, that, that's where it sort of sits. Now, very similar to the front limb. In the hind limb, it's going to come just below the hock. So replace the carpus or the knee with the hock. And it's going to come right down the back of the um, hind cannon, the metatarsus, right in between those splint bones. And do the same thing, come down quite a length and then split off into uh, the lateral and medial branches and attached to the top of the sesamoid bones. And again, same function, store um, elastic um, energy to help propel the horse forward. Um, there are some differences between the front and the hind suspensory, um, especially in regards to their injuries. So certainly I wouldn't want either of my suspensory ligaments to be injured front or hind, but if I was going to pick one, I would probably um, go with the front leg as being a little bit overall less severe um, than the hind leg. So um, let's, let me just jump forward a little bit. And so here is the front and these are just photographs. Um, again, I just want to point out some anatomy um, before we get any 
deeper into it. I think if we understand the anatomy, um, it's easier to understand how injuries can happen and then how we can rehabilitate those injuries. So this again, here's the, um, the knee is up here. So these are the little carpal bones. Here's our splint bones. Again, we're looking at it from the back. And Dr. Halliger, just so that since you have numbers there, because your pointer's not. Oh, yeah, yeah. Sure. yeah great. Oh, yeah. Yeah. Oh, oops. Sorry. <laughs> okay. So, yeah, number one is going to be our suspensory ligaments. Um, and then three is our cannon bone. Two is our, our inside splint bone. And four is our outside splint bone. So you, um, you can see that that ligament is nestled right in the back of the cannon bone. Now, if we go over to where we've cut the, the leg on the half shell, um, lots more numbers there. But again, three is our cannon bone, um, two is our splint, four is our splint. So two is inside splint and four is outside splint. And then what you can see is that the suspensory itself, number one, is kind of broken up into an A and a B. And if you look at it in this form in this section, you can see that it's kind of bilobed um, with a little, it seems like a little um, uh, divide in the middle. Um, and, and you can see that one of the lobes, this is in the front leg, is a little bit bigger than the other. So the inside medial lobe is a little bit smaller than the outside lobe or the lateral lobe. And then also just wanted to show you in relation to the other uh, tendons and ligaments in the back of the leg. So if we look at number eight and number seven, those are the superficial digital flexor tendon number eight. So uh, the closest to the back of the leg, closest to the skin surface. And then just underneath that is the deep digital flexor tendon, number seven. And then number six is our check ligament, um, which uh, sort of is a small, or I shouldn't say small, it's a shorter ligament that basically connects our suspensory ligament um, to our deep digital flexor tendon um, in, 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 uh, uh, like, in general. Um, so, and as we go down the leg um, in the front limb, the, that bilobed um, presentation of the suspensory doesn't change too much. Um, it kind of stays like that all throughout. Now, one thing I do also want to point out is as you guys probably have seen the best way for veterinarians to diagnose suspensory ligament injury is using an ultrasound. And with ultrasound, we um, can see the soft tissues very well. However, ultrasound waves do not penetrate bone. And if there's any bone in the way of us seeing the suspensory ligament, it's going to, uh, the bone will interfere with us being able to see that. So if we look at um, how the suspensory ligament is nestled sort of within that splint bone labeled number four, if we have our ultrasound probe on the back of the leg, then we may not see that whole little corner that's nestled right next to the splint bone. Um, and this can happen on the medial side as well, but maybe not quite to the same degree. Um, so what can happen is two things. Um, number one, we may not be able to see the whole suspensory. And therefore, when we're diagnosing things, it may ultrasound somewhat normal, but still have an injury off to those little corners that we can't see. Can so they can I ask you a, a couple questions yeah. about this. Is this leg in cross section, was it a healthy suspensory? 
This is a healthy suspense ring. So that the little white lines that are running through it, like you look at the check ligament and the deep and yeah, yeah. and they're so dense. Yeah. <laughs> And yeah, so that <laughs> is a super good question. So here's the thing about the suspensory. It is not just co composed of collagen fibers. So when we look at six, seven, and eight, our check ligament and our flexor tendons, they are composed predominantly of just collagen. If we look at our suspensory, it's got this collagenase colored tissue, plus it has little ribbons of white tissue. And then we have these like reddish brownish splotches all over the place. So the suspensory ligament um, is also composed of fat tissue and muscular tissue. So interspersed within those collagen fibers are muscle fibers, fat as well. So that's why we see this sort of array of splotches throughout the, that collagen fiber. We've got muscle fibers in there and we have fat tissue in there, okay? And that is also another reason why it's very difficult to diagnose these suspensory injuries because Oftentimes we see these, this muscle and fat tissue on the ultrasound, and it may be difficult to distinguish an injury from a big glob of fat or a big um, bundle of muscle fibers. So there are some tricks that we can do as vets to um, sort of help differentiate an actual injury um, with muscle tissue or fat tissue, but it definitely can, can be difficult. So, so that's rather unique as a, I mean, as a ligament, I always think of it as not having yep, yep. muscle and fat. <laughs> yep, exactly. And unfortunately it varies from horse to horse to horse as well. So, um, even, even from horse to horse, they may have different degrees of fat and muscle fiber in their suspensory ligaments. So it's not like there's a distinct pattern that we can look at from across horses to say what's muscle and what's fat, et cetera. Um, so every horse's suspensory is unique. And so if the, the embryonic development of the suspensory ligament is different from other ligaments. And because of that, we have this interspersion, interspersion, inters whatever, <laughs> of, of muscle and, um, of, and muscle and fat. So, um, yeah, absolutely. That was a good catch there, um, as far as what it looks like. And then again, because of these this anatomic difference in this particular ligament, it definitely um, can make it more susceptible to stresses and strains um, compared to potentially if it was all collagenous um, tissue, like the check ligament or something like that. Yeah. And, and just so that people aren't wondering, what is number five, nine, and 10? Five, nine, and 10 are all vessels. So um, nine and 10 um, are a vessel or a vein in an artery, um, probably the pulmar, where are we? Probably the pulmar um, uh, pulmar uh, vein, in, vein in artery. And then um, five, and probably just over from five underneath 10, um, those are the pulmar metacarpal vessels. So um, vein and, and um, artery. So the vasculature that's just running um, along down the leg. It's a great image. Yeah, it is a very good image. Um, doctor, I think this is a Denois 
paper. Uh -huh. He's a <laughs> he's a fantastic um, uh, with images and photographs, etc. So, um, but yeah, the this and this is a little bit higher. So we would be cut um, probably right about the level uh, in the other image um, with the whole corpus um, showing. Um, probably would be cut in cross section right about the level of where it's labeled number one um, on that image. So it's, that's about the level that we're looking at. Um, so uh, that that is sort of the anatomy of the foreleg. And let me just go forward one slide here. Um, yeah, so this is the hind leg and I'll try to orient you a little bit. Um, this is gonna be, um, number one again, is gonna be your superficial digital flexor tendon, two and three are your deep digital flexor tendons. Um, uh, just below or just, yeah, around four, um, four and eight-ish are gonna be uh, where your splint bones are. So um, between six and eight is going to be your lateral or outside splint bone. And between um, kind of between four and seven are going to be is going to be your medial splint bone. And this is on the hind limb. And so this is because of the shape of the splint bones on the hind. This is all shifted a little bit to the inside. OK, and um, below five, um, five is our suspensory ligament, um, is going to be the cannon bone. So this is uh, sort of um, kicked out to the, the, the medial side of things. So when we're doing an ultrasound on the hind limb, we have to image a little bit more from the inside of the leg than, than just from the back of the leg. Now, again, five is our suspensory. And even in this um, section, we can see that there is the same sort of tissue density um, as the flexor tendons. And then we also have some more whitish tissue and some reddish tissue as well. So again, we have intermixing of fat tissue, muscle tissue with that collagen fibers as well. Um, seven is going to be a vessel, um, and then eight is going to be, there's um, ligamentous tissue that sort of connects the um, cannon bone to the splint bone, and that's what that is there. Now, again, you could see a little bit more medially on this, on this view, where if we're trying to image this, the bones may the splint bones get, may get in the way of us really being able to see the suspensory ligament. So it definitely could have some uh, hidden damage that we can't fully assess with our ultrasound. Um, so the, that anatomically, that's some of the, the issues with <laughs> diagnosing suspensory desmitis. Um, Number one being um, its location being nestled in behind um, the splint bones. And then number two, the differences in the different fiber types creating some question on whether it's an injury or whether it's fat or muscle um, and not just normal fibers. Um, again, um, that the, so that's one problem that we may face in diagnosing things. And that's um, actually in favor, I guess, of um, us not being able to diagnose it properly um, and the need for potentially to fully determine if there's an injury, the need for an MRI. Now, some of the other issues that um, are in favor of overdiagnosis would be um, that when we try to do local anesthesia in this area to determine um, 
localize the injury, there's a lot of other structures that could be injured. And so even if nerve block localization has sort of narrowed it down to the proximal metacarpal area or the proximal cannon bone area in the front or the hind, there are many other structures in that area, the flexor tendons, the check ligament, the splint bones, the suspensory, the cannon bone, that all could get desensitized with that local anesthesia. And unfortunately, those structures don't get injured as much as the suspensory. So when we get localization to that area, oftentimes many people only look at the suspensory. And again, with some of the changes in uh, whether something is muscle or, or fat, it's very easy to say that a horse has a big hole in its suspensory ligament when it may not. So it could really be fat or muscle fiber, but it looks like a big black hole in the ligament. And because they may have had local anesthesia that uh, localizes it to the splint or to the suspensory region, proximal or proximal cannon region, and they see a black hole, then all of a sudden the horse has a bad suspensory injury when there was no investigation to see what the bones look like, what the flexor tendons look like, what the check ligament look like. And so it could be that your horse gets laid up for a suspensory injury for a year, and that was not necessarily the problem. And then that horse gets labeled as a horse with a suspensory injury, and it becomes very difficult to resell that horse or figure out why that you know horse is still lame after all this time when potentially that was not the injury to begin with. Hmm. So, um, I never realized how um, complicated the suspense, you know, you think of it as like this solid tissue and doesn't have all these like other little fibers running around in there. Um, yes. Yeah. And that's pretty unique um, to the horse, uh, obviously, and to this ligament. Um, most other ligaments are, don't have other types of tissue running through them. Um, and, and I do have to say, and in defense of veterinarians. Um, certainly technology has um, progressed over the past, you know, 20 some years. Our ultrasounds have improved tremendously and the quality of images that we can get with ultrasound now um, are much, much more detailed than they used to be. Um, and certainly, you know, um, if you look back at anatomic studies from ages ago, we know that the suspensory ligament has muscle and, and, and fat tissue, um, adipose tissue in it for, for a long, long, long time. Um, but it's only been since our ultrasound uh, technology has improved that we realize that those tissues look differently on the ultrasound, on ultrasound. So not everybody, um, and I'm not trying to put more aged <laughs> veterinarians uh, at fault here, but, um, you know, potentially when they learned ultrasound techniques, they were not um, educated about changing how they scan in order to try and um, determine whether something was a glob of fat or was actually an injury in the suspensory. Um, and so if you were never educated to that fact, you could still get along in your career and not realize that some of these things that you were diagnosing as holes or, or injury to the suspensory might actually be normal items. Um, 
uh, especially if you're getting newer and newer and newer ultrasounds and getting much more detailed um, images throughout um, your career, you might realize, not realize that all these things that you're seeing now um, aren't really terrible injuries, but part of the normal anatomy. So um, someone's asking if ultrasound is the best way to identify suspensory ligament injury versus x-ray or MRI. Okay, that's a really good question. So for sure, um, x-ray is not a tool that is typically used on these soft tissues. But I will say one caveat about that in a moment. Um, so yes, the first line of imaging is always going to be ultrasound. Um, and I do think for the most part, um, it is the best for probably moderate to severe injuries. Um, when we get down into very mild strains, I don't know if it's going to find all of them, especially if they're hidden off on the corners. If it's right in the middle um, of the ligament, uh, then yes, I think even a mild injury can be picked up with the ultrasound. But if we have a relatively normal ultrasound um, and but we have lameness localized to that area and all the other structures also appear normal, then there is probably a very good chance that there's an injury on the corners or the edges of the suspensory that we can't see. And then the best means to diagnosing that is gonna be MRI um, because the MRI is not gonna be, that there's not, there's no in interference um, because of the bony structures, we'll be able to see the entire ligament in cross-section, in longitudinal, um, in all three planes. And so we get a very proper assessment. So anytime um, there's a mild injury um, or an injury that we can't quite see, I would say MRI is 100% the better way to go. Um, if it's, but I would start, I would always start with an ultrasound. Now, back to the radiology or x-ray. Um, if you, and you can see from the image that's up here, that suspensory is very, very intimately attached to the bone. Um, and so what can happen when you do have some injury to that part of the suspensory ligament, it can tug on the cannon bone and it can cause inflammation and changes in the cannon bone that, um, depending on the severity and the chronicity, we can pick up uh, on x-rays. So I will say that when I have a horse that it has a leanness that's localized to this area. Um, whether or not I see anything on ultrasound, I do usually take at least one x-ray to see if I can see any chronic changes to the bone that may be indicative of some uh, effects on the cannon bone by the suspensory ligament. And then if my ultrasound is normal, but I do have x-ray changes, then I'm gonna be much, much more likely to put that horse in the MRI and really definitively determine what's going on in that bone and what's going on in that ligament to make sure that um, I'm, I'm seeing the whole picture, that I'm really um, understanding what's going on uh, with that suspensory ligament so that I can, rehabilitate that horse properly. Um, because if it is affecting the bone, um, there's always um, usually bone pain that's also involved in that complex. And so I want to address the bone pain as well as the ligament pain and injury, if that makes any sense. Mm -hmm. um, so is there a, um, how do I put this? When a horse exhibits lameness, is there 
a, a pattern that's kind of particular to a suspensory ligament injury? Well, I'm sure that many of you have heard um, that if the horse is more la lame in a circle with the affected leg to the outside. So for example, if I have a horse with a left front lameness and we're lunging him in a circle and the lameness looks worse when the horse is tracking right versus tracking left, so his left leg is on the outside of the circle, then it has to be a suspensory ligament or it has to be a soft tissue injury. Um, that sort of wives tale is pretty widely propagated um, for some reason. And uh, I will tell you that um, horses injure themselves uh, in many different ways. And you can have a suspensory ligament that is worse when the horse's leg is on the inside and less lame when the horse's leg is on the outside. You can have them where they're not lame uh, in a straight line, but they're lame in a circle. I can, you can, some people say if it's on lame or on soft ground, then it's gotta be a suspensory or a soft tissue injury but I've had horses that don't like the concussion of hard ground versus soft ground. So unfortunately there is no <laughs> set lameness for the suspensory uh, ligaments. It will, uh, the horse will do whatever it wants to do <laughs> and it will be lame. Uh, however, it wants to be lame regardless uh, of circle, straight line, hard ground, soft ground, inside leg, outside leg. Um, so while those sort of wives tales are out there, I would not believe any of them. <laughs> but it would be stance phase. Like when they're loading the leg, we'd see that they go, oof, as opposed to a flight phase. So, um, yeah, probably. Yeah, probably. Yep. You could, you could narrow it down to maybe a part of the stride. <laughs> yeah, 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 exactly. Yeah, it's going to hurt more when the leg is hitting the ground than when the leg is being propelled forward. Okay. Yeah. I wish they could talk. <laughs> yes, me too. Me too. Yes. So, um, and I, I can go back. Let's one, we can go back to this little, um, curve here, the stress strain curve, and um, just talk a little bit about how, um, in general, tendon and ligament injuries can occur. Um, and so all, all injuries to any structure um, happen when we go beyond a certain point. So um, When we, when we follow this curve up, um, we get to um, a point where the injury is going to just, um, sorry, I need to move this up, reach a failure. Um, and so when we're um, going up this curve, um, we have a elastic properties. And so in this, in the tendon and ligament, these elastic properties mean that, um, we can, uh, that the tendon and ligament can take on, um, all kinds of, um, stress or strain. Okay. And, and they can deal with it. And so as we load stress, so if we go, as we go up the, the Y version of, of the, the graph, if, as we increase stress or load on our structures, um, they get stiffer and they, but they can come back from this. So when we take the stress away, they come back to normal, uh, their normal properties. Now, when we get to a certain point, we have a little bit of trouble. And so what this plastic change means is that um, it's unable to come back to its normal shape. So in this elastic range, it can take a stress up to this point and always return to normal. When we get 
into this plastic range, which is um, doesn't doesn't go up the graph very high. So within this stress range right here up until failure, so er, 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 over here, um, anything above this level, um, these changes, it can't come back from. So within this short window before we reach failure, that there are changes that occur to the tendon or ligament that um, are permanent. So in this range, we can do lots of changes. The tendon or ligament will recover when we come back to no stress or no load put on it. But in this region, um, we get some permanent damages. So now, with all that said, and hopefully everybody's still with me, um, when we get to this tissue failure point, um, it can happen one of two ways. We could have gotten here very fast or we could have gotten here very slowly, okay? So we could have gone up, overloaded this um, at one time point. So we put stress or load on the tendon and the ligament so much so that it reached this tail tissue failure point all in one go, okay? Or we could have done this over time. So if you think about your horse who is a jumping horse, an eventing horse, a pleasure horse, trail riding horse, race horse, whatever, there's, uh, they're, they're going through this, this line many times, every time they put their foot down mm -hmm. and pick it up and put it down and pick it up and put it down. And most of the time it's probably in this elastic range and nothing bad is happening. But sometimes it's gonna be in this plastic range where they're gonna get micro uh, accumulation of little micro damages along the course of their whole life. So while they spend most of their time down here, by the time they get to be 23 or 24, they've accumulated some of these plastic changes. And so, the point at which they reach this tissue failure may take 18 or 20 or 23 years instead of one terrible step. Okay. So hopefully that makes sense. So, so let, let me just see if I understand this. Yes. Um, a catastrophic event, a horse taking a really bad jump and really landing by it. It's an instant tissue Boom. failure. Yes, we have overloaded our elastic and plastic areas and we've injured it all in one foul swoop, boom. The stress or the load is so high that we've not, we've gone past elastic and we've gone past plastic and we've reached tissue flip failure. In and one. would that be um, the length of the suspensory ligament or does that tend to be in a particular plate like, like one area of the ligament just can't handle it anymore. Yeah, yeah. It's usually in the, the now when we're talking about like catastrophic rupture, it's at the rupture site. Um, but it's probably at the weakest point in the whole ligament. So the, again, with a suspensory, we've got some muscle and fat tissue kind of thrown in there. And so the weakest point is probably gonna be somewhere around there because there's not as much collagenase or collagenous tissues um, to keep it as strong. And so um, we're probably going to see some failures there. But there's a lot of factors that go into it. Confirmation, shoeing, footing, uh, what the horse is doing um, that are going to also determine what the weakest point in the tendon or ligament is. And, and in catastrophic failure, is that like permanent? This horse is never going to come back. If it, yes. Yeah. Yeah. It, 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 well, never going to come back, I guess, is relative to what the, what the horse's job is. But in the case of say a ruptured tendon or ligament, certainly we can get those to heal. Um, but to what degree they heal and to what um, uh, to what degree they heal 
everything will heal, but how it heals, whether it still causes pain and dysfunction, um, and, and what the horse's intended purpose is. So now if it's a racehorse and something ruptures and I rehabilitate it, it may not be a racehorse ever again, but it maybe could be a trail horse. Or if I've got a barrel racer and I rupture my deep digital flexor tendon, I may not be a barrel racer anymore, but I could be a root mare. Um, and there's also um, a degree, right? So when we say tissue failure, we could have tissue failure right at that little site, which causes a core injury within the whole suspensory. And so we may not have catastrophically injured our entire suspensory, but we could have a uh, three millimeter by four millimeter circular failure within that ligament. Does that make sense? Yeah. So we don't necessarily have to injure the entire thing, but we've reached tissue failure at that one spot. And so that one spot causes the suspensory to have that focal inflammation and, and disease. And would be the weakest point even in healing. Mm -hmm. And then, um, and then this, somebody's asking, is the age, uh, uh, let's see, is, is age a couple, uh, I, there's a funny word in here, but is age a uh, contributing factor to loss of elasticity? In other words, my 24 year old horse has been diagnosed with a potential strain because his fetlocks appear lower, although he's not been lame and his workload has not increased. Yeah, so um, while I love to say age is not a disease, um, as we all experience, as we age, things um, are stiffer <laughs> and um, uh, stickier. So yes, um, certainly elasticity does um, go away with age. And some of that also has to do with this, these plastic changes, these little micro damages that um, haven't result or resulted in injury, but we've accumulated along the way. So I have um, been run, a runner for many, many years, and I've never had a very bad like knee injury or ankle injury or anything like that. But certainly nowadays, when I start my runs, my ankles and my knees are creaky and stiff and sore until I get going. Um, and at some day, you know, potentially I, I will have an injury because over time I've, I've, I've aged and I've accumulated some of these plastic um, non-reversible changes in my tendons and ligaments that, um, that, that will ultimate, ultimately result in, in me having a soft tissue structure injury. Is that so is it so in that plastic uh, changes place? Is it like you're building little scar tissue? Or? Yeah, that's a good way to think about it. Yeah, um, that's not going to have the same elastic property. Right, exactly. So if you think about it in, um, you know, the from a collagen standpoint, um, we want uh, in normal tendons and ligaments, we want long straight collagen fibers, and that's what gives them their elasticity. But if we get these little micro damages, the collagen fibers can get curly and kinked and not be straight. And so they are definitely going to be less elastic um, in, within there, within that um, entire structure. And, and is there any, I, I think I already know, but is there any way to reverse that plastic creep once it, no, yeah. No, no. <laughs> Yeah, um, the only thing that's reversible, so to speak, is the anything that happens within the elastic range. Once you get into that plastic area, whatever damage has been caused is is sticking with you forever. So that could be something that happened in the starting of a horse uh, before you ever bought it, and it could show up later on because yep. it's already wow. Yeah. And so, and that's one thing, like I have a lot of people say to me, I don't get this. What, wh why did this happen? You know, uh, nothing. I don't remember any event happening. Um, I, nothing striking all of a sudden, you know, he just started limping and that, and that could be totally the case. 
maybe nothing did happen, maybe on that particular ride, that footstep and then the next footstep and the next footstep, we have reached this point right here um, in that horse's lifetime, in that tissue, uh, in that structure's lifetime within that horse, we, we reached tissue failure. And it was just that one extra step. So I tell people like the, hor the horses have been accumulating damage to their structures their whole life. And at some point there's a weak spot in every structure. And at some point that weak spot has been tipped over the edge to what it can accommodate and it, and it becomes painful. There was an injury there. So um, just like, you know, all of a sudden a horse comes in, it's lame, it comes in and I diagnose it with arthritis. And you think, well, nothing, nothing ever happened to him. Why does he have arthritis now? Well, he didn't just get arthritis. He's been dealing with those little changes that have been occurring to the joint for many, many, many years and little, little bits have been a, a being accumulated in the joint, in the bone, in, in the around, around the joint that suddenly now you come in, it's lame and I take an x-ray and I see arthritic changes. And, um, and, and, and so it's been an accumulation of these small little things over time that you don't see, they don't feel, but it's happening behind the scenes. Right. Um, we have several questions. So let me run through some of these. Is, um, uh, do ruptures usually include bone or not necessarily? Okay, not necessarily. Um, for example, and actually ruptures in, in, um, flexor tendons or, um, the, any of the ligaments in the back of the leg, um, co commonly, unless we're talking about sort of like a catastrophic racing in, in, uh, injury, um, usually do not involve the bone. Um, usually like, um, a deep digital flexor tendon rupture, um, is just, just that, just the deep digital flexor tendon. Um, or a superficial digital flexor tendon rupture is just that structure rupturing. So usually it does not include, the, it does not involve the bone unless there is, um, unless maybe in racing or um, if there is um, like acute trauma. So the horse falls in a hole or um, falls down a cliff or, you know, there's something else involved with, um, with the trauma to the, the tendons um, also traumatizes the bone. Sounds like you need high intensity, high force to actually damage the bone. Yeah. Okay. Yeah. Um, does a horse who has an injury in the plastic zone, lame and not rideable? Um, not necessarily. Now you could have some strains in the plastic range that could cause some inflammation and pain and, um, that they maybe need a few weeks to a few months to quiet that stress or strain down, and then they recover and they're fine. So again, um, the, and they've probably accumulated some of that trauma, um, but it may not be anything, they may not have any lameness associated with any of the changes in that plastic range, or they might have some mild lame, transient lamenesses. Um, can a horse fully recover from a suspensory injury? Yes. <laughs> we'll get there. Well, okay. So yeah. we'll just leave that for a moment. Yeah. Um, somebody's saying it sounds kind of like metal fatigue, you know, and it, it, um, the properties of metal. Yeah. Yeah. Yep. Yep. Exactly. Exactly. Yep. Yep. And someone's asking, can you speak to a young horse with, uh, talk about a young horse with hypermobility in the fetlock joint? Is that going to be more damaging to a suspensory ligament? Um, yes. So that's a good question. I guess my follow-up question back would be, is there hyperflexibility or hypermotility in the fetlock joint because the suspensory apparatus is weak? So um, is it confirmational or is there already inherent weakness in the suspensory apparatus? And that's why the fetlock is hyper 
flexible or hyper extensible. So, um, and a lot of that does come with confirmation. So if it's a young horse and um, it looks like the fetlock is starting to drop or they have a, a, that sort of dropped fetlock stance, then I would say that um, that could be confirmationable, confirmational, but yes, it's probably putting a lot of pressure on that suspensory ligament um, in, at an early age. Yeah. Um, yeah. And so, you know, when I, when you talk about this, like that these plastic changes can occur anywhere along the lifespan of the horse, which then accumulate to a failure, it, you know, I, personally, when I see people working young horse in round pens with really deep footing where they're going side, you know, they're, they're not upright in vertical balance. Mm -hmm. um, it, I, it, my gut has always been unhappy. <laughs> yes. Yep. Yep. And, and I totally agree with you. And I actually would probably say that um, more important is the horse not being in vertical balance rather than the footing. So even on hard ground, if they're not in vertical balance, then, then they're putting abnormal stress and strain on their structures. So right. yes, I do think that the soft, we de tend to think of um, really deep soft footing as being damaging. And I would agree that's probably not ideal, but I would say a young horse in vertical balance in the soft footing is probably better off than the young horse out of vertical balance in any footing. Does that make sense? Yeah, got it. The, okay. the, in other words, if you're, and, and for those who don't understand vertical balance, this means that the withers are upright pointing to the ceiling and not angled over, which is gonna asymmetrically load the legs, therefore put more strain on them. Um, so just think of the horse, you know, motorcycling around a turn. Yes, absolutely. Um, yeah, that's a good analogy. Um, you know, that's, so that is more critical because they're asymmetrically loading than the footing itself, which they could adapt to. Yes, absolutely. To the yep, absolutely. Got it. Yeah. So I, I would say the first problem to correct is the vertical balance. And the second problem to correct is the footing. Right. So somebody, what is the best footing for a horse who's had a suspensory injury? I'm wondering if the corollary here is vertical balance is the most important thing. Yeah. Yeah. And then if you do have a horse that has a suspensory injury, then certainly um, like really slogging them down in deep footing is not going to be ideal. And honestly, I would say um, the best footing for any tendon and ligament to be in is grass that's not super hard or super dry ground. So we don't want the kind, the kind of grass that we all dream about taking our horse riding, running across the field in. That's the kind of grass. So if you can sort of equate that sort of um, level of foot, foot stability um, to an arena, um, that's probably the best type of arena footing to be in. So, and for all of you on the West Coast that don't know what grass is, <laughs> so it's this green stuff that we let our horses on the East Coast graze on. I was amazed that I've only been in Virginia for three and a half, four years. I didn't even know it existed. Um, but um, so yeah, so not too thick, deep. Um, some of the footings that you're starting to see, especially on the, I think uh, I've seen it here a bit, some of the really nice footings, um, arena footings that you're starting to see um, that kind of have a mixture of sand and some other products, some of these synthetic footings, um, that it looks like it's going to be really, really hard. Um, and you, but but when you ride on it, it's very comfortable. Um, the horse's horse's foot doesn't really sink into it, but it's not firm like concrete. Um, is is very nice. Um, but again, if your horse is not balanced, I don't care what kind of footing you're in. You're, you're not going to rehab that tendon or ligament injury well. So I will tell you, like, if you come see me and I diagnose, diagnose your horse with a, a, any kind of tendon or ligament injury, um, you're going to be walking for a while. Um, but I put you to good work while you're doing that walk exercise 
And um, I usually recommend a lot of core stability training um, uh, and a lot of like proprioceptive exercises, because the last thing I want is for your horse to lose any um, balance or top line or ability ability to pick himself up and propel himself forward properly. So you, so I usually take it as an opportunity to get this horse um, maintain his fitness, um, but also get his um, core stability right where it needs to be so that when you do go back to work and are doing trot work or doing counter work or whatever, um, your horse is not, uh, not out of shape and can carry itself properly. So, so someone's actually asked if surefoot pads are helpful in the recovery from suspensory injuries or not. Um, yeah. Absolutely. So, I mean, is part, is part of a core training program for sure. There's lots of things we can do, exercises we can do uh, on and off the pads that are going to help strengthen core, the core strength, um, and also like relieve um, some tension on some of those other structures. So, um, the horse may, you know, if the horse has got a, a front limb or hind limb suspensory, it may want to stand on a, a different firmnesses of the pads. Um, some of the, I, again, I know I talked about it last time with the deep digital flexor tendon, but I really like those wedge pads for creating a little um, stretch along the back of the leg. And so with a suspensory, if I if I, again, I don't want it to contract upwards and be um, too short, I want it to um, stretch out a little bit. So a lot of times I'll use those wedge pads, depending on the degree of injury, where the injury is, um, uh, certainly uh, standing on them in certain ways. Like if we've got suspensory branch injury, they may um, want to stand with their, their front of their foot off the pad, but the back of their foot on the pad um, to give the, give their, the, the back, the, the fetlock, so to speak, more support. Um, so again, like I'm sure, um, and Wendy's way more experienced with, you know, playing around with the sure foot pads and the horse will often tell you how he wants to stand on them. But I think anytime you're um, using these, um, the, the pads, um, you are uh, encouraging balance. And so any kind of balance, we want vertical balance, right? Um, so the horse needs to know where its true balance point is. And so anytime we are encouraging them to find their own balance and their balancing point, anytime we can do that um, by any means, it's going to benefit you in the, in the long run, whether you're preventing injuries or you're treating an injury that's already occurred. And, and I would think that you would need as the veterinarian to say that there's sufficient healing before you start challenging that leg. Yes. Yep. 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 And, and there are the different firmnesses. And so if I've got a mild to moderate injury with not a lot of damage um, to the suspensory, I may um, start them much sooner than a very severe injury um, where I, I, and maybe I'm starting with different, you know, maybe I can start with a softer, um, like the physio pad on a mild to moderate injury, but with a severe injury, I'm going to, you know, wait till things calm down, but I may start with something really firm or hard because I don't want them to wobble around on something super soft. And so there, there may be a gradation of introduction of the different firmnesses and what kinds of pads and that kind of stuff. And certainly I'm not going to put a severe injury on a wedge pad right away. That's like a couple months or or more down the line. Um, I'm going to put it on something that's going to encourage it to find a good balance point and a relaxation point um, in the in the earlier stages before I start introducing, okay, now we've got to the point where I want to use this wedge pad 
for a stretch, um, like a rehabilitation stretch versus finding some stability and, and um, uh, co core comfort and balance. Um, and then somebody's asking, um, you know, if their horse is on stall rest, what, you know, is, I think the question here probably is that there's a lot of times horses are put on stall rest when they're injured. What is your perspective of stall rest and how soon do you want to get this horse moving again? Yeah. Okay. So, um, so in my, for, in my personal opinion, stall rest is a four letter word. I hate stall rest. There's nothing except for a fracture or a cat, like a fracture, a broken bone. So a catastrophic failure of the bone or a rupture of a tendon or ligament. Those two are severe injuries, severe injury to the bone or severe injury to the tendon or ligament. Those are the only two circumstances where I put a horse strictly on stall rest. Every other injury requires some mobility in order for it to heal. Now, granted, you could have a really bad um, bone injury or a really bad tendon and ligament injury that is just right before a rupture or just right before a fracture where you wouldn't want to be walking the horse around a lot. Maybe you're walking him out the stall to you know, 20 steps to the little grass patch. You let him eat for five minutes and you walk him back in and that's it. And you do that once or twice a day. So, but to me that, that means that that horse has an exercise program and it's 20 steps out and 20 steps back twice a day because that's a pretty severe injury. Um, when we're talking about sort of our normal, normal injuries um, that are not near catastrophic or catastrophic, um, all of those I think should be doing some form of exercise every day. Now, most of the time it's walking, but walking is a job and it's an exercise. It's, it should not be a chore. And, it, and so I, I hate to say that um, I, I want it to be exercise in people's minds. I don't want to say the horse is being rested because that implies that he's not to do anything. If your doctor says go home and rest with your leg elevated, you stay on the couch and you don't exercise. So um, it's probably all terminology in the grand scheme of things, but um, uh, most things I think need a little exercise. They need a little bit of stress and strain um, in order to heal. So it may only be 10 minutes of walking, um, but it is an exercise program that should be taken seriously. And within that walk work, you might be walking over poles or you might be um, walking a big circle or you may be doing a little bit of backup or you may be um, coming back from your 10 minute walk and doing some um, passive range of motion exercises or something like that. So um, in my mind, stall rest is um, very dependent on the injury um, and um, in most cases, I don't like to say stall rest. Um, I like to say controlled exercise program um, because then people will look at it as actually an exercise program instead of, well, my horse is injured. I'm just going to stick them in the stall. I'll see you in nine months. And then by the time we get to where the horse is off, off stall rest or can do something, it's out of shape. It has no top line um, and it's actually going to be harder for it to come back to work um, and it's going to be more prone to re-injury than if we had done, kept it on an exer a little bit of an exercise, gradually increasing exercise program all along. Well, and I think that's where uh, exercise physiology and, and rehabilitation has, has really changed over the past, you know, my lifetime, where stall rest was what you did. And now we're like, you know, for people that soft cast, even that whole idea has changed. And, yep. Yep. As soon as, you know, I know some people have hip replacements. They're up in six hours after surgery. <laughs> yep. yep, exactly, exactly. So, yeah, um, and I do think it it's, 
um, it is probably, you know, a lot of terminology, a lot of semantics and stuff like that. But, you know, if you're, if your veterinarian says, okay, well, he's going to be on stall rest from now on, don't be afraid to say, okay, what do you mean by stall rest? Does that mean I'm putting him in a stall and I'm not allowed to take him out? Or does that mean he can go in a small paddock? Or does that mean I can take him for walks? Um, so really get an idea of what that means for your vet because to your vet maybe it means the same thing as it means to me but you don't know that and so you hear stall rest and you put your horse in the stall and you don't take them out and so i think um i think it's totally fair game to to if you hear let's let's put your horse on stall rest it's totally fair for you to say okay let's break this down what does stall rest mean can he go out at all? Can he go for walks? Can he do this? Can he do that? And you might find that your version of stall rest and their version of stall rest are really not the same thing. And honestly, that probably goes for everything. You know, all the conversations that you can have with your veterinarian. There are a lot of things that um, we as vets say that you may take completely different than what we mean. Um, and that's because we have cut it down to the shortest number of words possible. <laughs> so stall rest um, is a lot easier to say than you can do this, 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 and this, but not that. Um, and so we've just narrowed it down to the, the um, you know, a lot of times I find myself saying, well, just put them in standing wraps. And then suddenly somebody's like, well, can you, what are, what are standing wraps for you? Can I put them in back on track quick wraps? Oh yeah, you could do that. Um, can I use quilts with polos? Well, let's talk about that. You know, so, and then everybody's got a different version of what a quilt is and everybody's got a different version of what a wrap is. And so um, I think it's, you know, unless somebody asks me a question, I'm just going to throw out, oh, just put them in standing wraps. Well, there are lots of types of standing wraps. And what does that mean? And how long should they wear them? Can they wear them 24 hours at a time? When do I change them? So if you're not sure, just ask, pester your vet with questions. And if your vet doesn't like to be pestered with questions, then maybe that's not the right vet for you. But you didn't hear from, you didn't hear that out of my mouth, but, um, uh, <laughs> but I mean, I think it's our job to make sure that you understand our directions. And if you have any questions about our directions, then you should ask what it really means to do X, Y, and Z. And, and you could take that exact statement and put the word doctor. Yes. <laughs> yes. Yes, exactly. Yes, yes. for sure. Cause yeah. I had that exact, you know, like when I had my, I fractured my left acetabulum in 1984 and he sent me home basically on stall rest. <laughs> yeah. yeah. And it's yeah. like, and I had to call him up and ask, could I swim? And he said, yeah, I could swim sec. I could only swim six feet. But if I hadn't asked the question, I wouldn't have, I would have just deteriorated. Like, yeah, exactly. Yep. Um, and we tend to, uh, to, well, sometimes we don't even know what question to ask. Yeah. And that is true. And I would say, um, and, and it's always okay to come back and after you've thought about things and ask, like all the, all your, you know, your vet has email, right? So, you know, it takes you four hours to process all this information you just got about your horse potentially having an injury. And then when you get over the shock of your horse having an injury, you have 10 billion questions which now the vet's not standing right in front of you um, for you to ask all those questions. And so I think email's fair game, give them a call and have them call you back when they have a time where they can, you know, sit and chat with you about it a little bit more. Um, you know, uh, I think probably personally, I will say that I think email or actual verbal conversation is probably the best bet, texting, is probably too short of a modality or communication tool to really get some of these across unless it's a quick question like can i hand graze them for five minutes sure is probably that's probably but going over um exercises and 
and treatment plans and chewing plans and that kind of stuff um, may be a, lost a little bit in translation with text messaging. So email might be better or just an actual verbal conversation is probably better. Um, is there a, a, a is there some kind of standard protocol for rehabbing an injury like a suspensory ligament? I mean, granted, the degree of severity is going to alter time frame. Yeah, um, I think um, so. Yeah, I think it, any of the tendon and ligament injuries are probably fairly similar that in that you have a plethora of options to choose from um, and what you ultimately choose probably depends on your personal preferences and your veterinarian's personal preferences. But um, in general, I would say um, a controlled exercise program um, at the very least, and then you can add from there. So some um, may need anti-inflammatory medications. So um, butyrbanamine for a short period of time, um, depending on the chronicity. Um, so if it's a very acute injury, um, cold therapy is probably indicated. Um, if it's a very chronic uh, injury, we might be using warm therapy to create, uh, create elasticity before we do our exercising. So warmth always um, makes things more elastic and uh, freer moving. And so if it's a more chronic injury or chronic disease, then we're probably going to use warm. Um, but there's things like shockwave. Shockwave therapy is fantastic um, for uh, creating an influx of blood flow to the injured area, which brings in um, anti-inflammatory mediators, it uh, brings in growth factors and that kind of stuff. So we do know that shockwave um, improves the, the, quality, the end product, quality of end product after injury. There are um, regenerative or biologics. So um, any of the platelet-rich plasma, stem cell, um, autologous condition serum, autologous condition proteins, those are often can be injected if there's a discrete like hole or lesion in the tendon or ligament, we can put that right into the injury site. Um, if there's not a discrete hole in it, we can kind of put, bathe it, bathe the area. So I'll stick needles around there um, to, to put the biologics um, right close to the injury. Um, laser, um, uh, PEMF, like there's all sorts of um, rehab modalities that you could employ. Therapeutic ultrasound is um, probably, uh, is one of the best ones for um, helping with elasticity um, and, and creating some healing um, within tendon and ligaments, not so much for bones or joints, but certainly for tendon and ligaments. Um, and again, some of those things are widely, more widely available than others. So you would, um, that you're probably more likely to see a shockwave at um, an equine veterinary practice than um, a therapeutic ultrasound. Um, you're more likely to probably um, have availability of um, PRP or um, autologous condition serum or autologous condition protein um, stall side than you are stem cells. So um, it's really going to probably come down to what's available for your wallet and what's available to your vet. And then you guys can come up with a plan to implement um, the, for rehab, um, uh, other rehab resources for treating tendon ligament injuries. Um, as far as a actual rehab controlled exercise program, um, at the core is going to be walking exercise and then um, a slowly gradual increase to trot work and then slowly gradual increase to canter work. Um, the intervals between those will, de will definitely vary by the degree of injury. And I, I would think along the way you're re-ultrasounding, checking to see how the tendons, how the ligaments doing, is it healing? before yep. you advance the horse to a higher impact. Yeah, absolutely. Yep. And we know from 
um, other types of studies um, that oftentimes uh, ultrasound graphically, um, it may look healed, yet it's not it's not completely healed. So our imaging modality will underestimate what's going on at a tissue or cell level. Um, so we certainly don't want to add anything in until we see some ultrasonic graphic um, improvement, number one. And then at some point, um, you know, if it looks good ultrasonographically, then um, we may be going mostly on clinical picture. So um, we act like I add in a little bit and if everything stays good, then we add in a little bit more. If we get some soreness or leanness or we see um, uh, the inflammation, if we see physical inflammation in the tissues, um, then I have you back off. Even if there's no leanness, if I see some inflammation um, in the tissues or you feel heat, then we back off. So um, some, unfortunately, sometimes, again, because the tissue and cellular healing isn't complete yet, we may under, the, our ultrasound may overestimate how well things look. Um, it's going to go on the clinical picture. Um, so there's been uh, a question about wraps and whether or not wraps are recommended, because you mentioned like wraps to warm the leg. But in terms of support, um... yeah, um, I think that's another one that um, is a little bit up in the air. Um, you know, standing wraps, um, so quilts with a stretchy um, track bandage type thing, is is probably depending on how tight you wrap it, may give some compression and a little bit of support, but it's not there to keep the suspensory ligament together. Um, it's there to provide some compression um, for the tissues and, and, and that's probably about it. Um, if you're talking about um, during exercise, again, compression may be the most beneficial thing, but it's probably not gonna hold the tissues together. Um, so for me, when they're wearing standing wraps or something like that in the stall um, at night, it's probably for warmth um, more than anything else to maintain elasticity that way. When we get to the point where we're exercising again, um, whether you're putting um, any sort of boot on or um, compression bandage on while you're exercising. Um, again, I don't think it's going to keep anything together, but it may help, comp you know, compression is going to help with blood and lymphatic flow um, and, and edema and that kind of thing. So it may be supportive from that, that standpoint, but it's not going to actually provide structural support, if that makes any sense. Yeah, I mean, the way I've always looked at it is, you know, the suspensory or the ligaments are running vertically and anything going horizontally cannot support and the vertical forces that are coming on. And it's certainly in the fetlock with the weight of the horse's body coming down into that joint, there's, you'd have to cast yeah. it. Yeah, 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 yeah. And I think some of the, the you know, besides, um, you know, doing some of these other things to just back up and, you know, what's in a, what's, what's supportive for the suspensory ligament while it's healing. Um, I think making sure that the horse's foot is balanced and um, trimmed and shod appropriately. And there are suspensory type shoes, um, but really in essence, um, anything that supports the the back of the leg um, is going to support the suspensory apparatus. So a bar shoe will give that fetlock and suspensory some support. So um, if, if if we're throwing um, things into the mix with what you know how we should sort of address these the suspensory injury or to support the suspensory in a horse that may be um, 
have a propensity to have some conformation that will put stress and strain on the suspensory apparatus, then, you know, certainly putting a bar shoe on that horse is going to be beneficial to help prevent further injury or damage to that structure. And what's your perspective on wedge pads for suspensory? Um, I think it depends a little bit. I go back to the horse's foot conformation. Um, and so if it's a horse that has um, like a, a low heel, long toe type of thing, then I would say probably it's a horse that needs a wedge pad. Um, but, um, I, and I could be pulling this out of my butt a little bit, but I'm pretty sure I saw a study where they showed that just putting the bar shoe on itself um, does as much as putting a certain degree of wedge on with a regular shoe. Yeah, because you so, have to worry about crushing the heel and, and then just keeping the foot running forward anyway. <laughs> yeah, yeah. So, um, um, and the frog, you, the frog can have exposure to the ground and everything like that. So um, you may get as much out of just putting a bar on, a uh, bar shoe on, rather than wedging the horse up and covering up the bottom of the foot. Um, but if so, but so if the horse has got good, fairly good foot conformation, then I probably would just go with a bar. But if the horse has poor foot conformation and has low heel and is really needs some help there, then I would say potentially that's a horse that would also put a wedge on, um, maybe a, a, probably a wedge with a bar shoe. So, um, okay, this is a, it's not a random question. However, what, what percentage of suspensory ligament injuries, chronic, do you think come from poor, poorly balanced feet? Um, hmm, that's a good question. Um, I would say without putting a number on it, I would say a good percentage of them, um, because a lot of times what I will see is a horse that comes in with a lameness that localizes almost, almost all the way to the foot, but then I've got to go all the way up to the suspensory to get the rest of it out. So it's probably a primary foot problem that has then caused some suspensory stress and strain. Um, and then, then I'll see another percent of them where um, it's the opposite, um, where they, I, they might get a little bit better with foot block, but they get all the way better with the suspensory blocked, but that suspensory probably got injured because of the poor foot balance. So um, I would say it, there's probably a strong correlation between foot balance and suspensory injuries. However, there are definitely suspensory injuries that happen um, with a normal foot or a well-balanced foot. Um, and that may just be the nature of, again, maybe that horse is not going around in good balance. Like, Maybe right. their owner doesn't know how to ride, and so they're not in vertical balance. And so being off balance, they overstrain, they constantly are overstraining their left front. And so then all of a sudden, even though their farrier does a spectacular job keeping their feet balanced, there's, you know, they pull their uh, left front suspensory because the owner doesn't know how to ride. So um, for all of you, I don't know, do you have on your website or your channel anything about vertical balance? Um, Dr. Raquel Butler did a webinar and she talked about yeah. vertical. Yeah. Okay. But I yeah. would love if you would come back and talk. <laughs> I would love to have you anytime. Oh my God. So yeah, we can talk about that. But there are good resources out there who are better than me. If you are interested in what understanding what vertical balance is, I definitely I definitely think that it's something that is, if, as a horse owner, if you're looking to keep your horse happy and healthy um, and rideable, vertical balance is definitely something you need to learn about <laughs> and horizontal balance. But I think vertical balance is probably even more important than horizontal balance, yeah. um, but balance, <laughs> yes. So um, yes, and I think, you know, there's a lot of horses you know, if they're ridden properly and they're ridden balanced, they're avoiding a lot of 
potential injuries out there. And again, there are horses that are highly competitive horses who are probably well ridden and probably well ridden, very well balanced, but they're still by nature of them being a, a, a meter 40 jumper, um, you know, or, or Grand Prix jumper um, or Grand Prix dressage horse that's doing 18 shows a year, they're gonna, you know, their bodies are gonna um, undergo some stress and strain and they're gonna be prone to injuries. Yeah. Okay, that's all the questions, I think. Oh, good, yeah. good. Yeah, <laughs> those are all good questions. So, and this is not an easy topic. So uh, hopefully if you, well, you guys can find me, um, if you look for Marion Dupont Scott Equine Medical Center, you can find me and you can email me. And if you have more questions, I'm happy to answer them. Awesome. So, so I guess the moral of the story is that it's really important to pay attention to the level of stress that the horse experiences throughout his entire life. Yes. Yeah. Uh, yeah. Because it's gonna, it's gonna mine are low mileage models. <laughs> yes. Um, yep. But that you know, just like people, um, little injuries accumulate, and then what appears to be a sudden onset actually is an accumulation. Yes. Absolutely. Yep. Yep. Absolutely. Yeah. And vertical balance and balance feet are critical to avoiding injuries as much as possible. Yep. Yep. Awesome. I think those are two excellent summation points. Great. Yeah. Well, Dr. Kelleher, you know, it's such a pleasure to talk to you and I really appreciate you sharing your knowledge with us. And, um, it, you know, as you said, it's not an easy topic and, you know, not everybody has access to all the bells and whistles to be able to deal yeah. with, this, but it sounds to me like a plan can be created at any, at, at low, low tech and high tech. Yeah, absolutely. Yeah. Yep. Yep. Um, and this is just go ahead and unshare your screen and we'll wrap it up. Okay. Um, um, there we go. And, and, um, I know that you said this was your second favorite topic. What's your third favorite topic? Oh, geez. Uh, well, pro probably any, like, go, like I just love rehab tools. So any sort of rehab stuff. Okay. Um, yeah. So well, we'll be in touch. Yeah. Oh, <laughs> because... or wounds, which again, oh. that's, has nothing to do with anything, but just gory pictures and, and wound healing, but I do love wounds. <laughs> okay. All right. So we'll, we'll plan to be back for rehab and wounds. Um, okay. It's just, it's, I really enjoy talking to you and you're, you're so thorough in your answers. It's, and just, it's great. I love it. Thank you. Thank you very much. I'm happy, happy to help out any way I can. All right. So. Well, we'll be in touch. Okay. Thanks, thank you so much for joining me tonight and thank you everybody tomorrow you do not have to sign up through uh, murdoch method for the webinar i will send out another link um it's the effortless rider course webinar i'm going to do with callie king we're going to give you great tips to improve your riding because if you are in balance it's going to help your horse be in balance and avoid those injuries so yes. tune in tomorrow and we'll see you very soon thanks so much again and have a great night bye